Hello, everybody. Um, actually, yeah, I said I'm, I'm at the and I'm currently finishing my postdoc in uh, Anton Adamantis' lab here at the University of Bern. Um, and in our lab, as I said, we are mostly interested in understanding the function of sleep. Uh, in particular, um, uh, based on my, my PhD work, uh, we're, we're very interested in understanding how emotions are um, Processed, processed and uh, consolidated during uh, during uh, REM sleep in particular. And I titled my talk, uh, Paradoxical Somatoendritic Decoupling Supports Cortical Plasticity During uh, REM Sleep. So um, all my research has been based on um, a common uh, hypothesis, which is based on the fact that uh, relevant information, information that has to be remembered in time, uh, is strategically associated by the brain with uh, internal processes. So as I said, I'm mostly interested in emotions, and today we'll mostly present you that, but there are other types of internal processes that are associated with uh, external information from the external world, and those are, for example, motivation, attention, experience, or cognition. And this association occurs through a tight regulation of local networks during experience, so during wakefulness, and during subsequent sleep, where they are consolidating, this generates uh, memory retention. However, as I will show to you, to you today, when we perturb this uh, regulation of the network uh, during wakefulness or, or most probably during sleep, this is also able to generate aberrant memories. And today we'll talk to you mainly about what's going on during sleep, so how sleep is able to store uh, information, particularly emotional information, and also uh, what happens when we perturb this activity during sleep in order to obtain uh, uh, memories that are uh, aberrant. So we'll firstly introduce you uh, sleep. As you most, most probably know, sleep is a, a recurrent and reversible behavior, which is uh, associated with decreased consciousness and lower sensory awareness from the external world. And this has been uh, observed in most species uh, studied so far. However, there is a, uh, it is becoming more clear that there is a tight link between uh, sleep functions and sleep complexity and the complexity of the brain itself or the nervous system. In fact, uh, sleep has not been identified in uh, uh, adult sponges, so uh, species that don't have neurons. Um, even though those, those animals, they display a circadian rhythm, so day versus night, uh, but sleep behaviors have been already identified in uh, jellyfish, so animals that have neurons, but they don't have a central nervous system. And the more, you, um, there, the more there is complexity in the phylogeny, um, so the more the uh, nervous system is increasing its complexity, uh, the more sleep will co-evolve together with increased functions and uh, complexity of the architecture itself. So, for example, from nematodes where you have associative learning, you can move to animals where you have operant, uh, operant conditioning, attention, other function uh, related to the brain like plasticity, uh, cognition, etc. And you arrive at the level of the phylogeny where uh, mammals, birds, and even reptiles they display a dichotomy at the level of the um, at the level of, of, of sleep itself, so where um, Actually, we can distinguish between two peculiar phases of sleep, which has, are defined as non-rapid eye movement and rapid eye movement sleep, or more simply non-REM and REM sleep. So, um, ah, locked. Sorry. Okay. So, um, the mammalian brain, as I was saying, is daily switching between different brain states, which are defined experimentally by electroencephalographic recordings good, together with uh, electromyography. And those are defining spe specific electrophysiological functions and oscillations that are peculiar of each brain state. For example, here you have wakefulness and the EEG they're displaying high frequency, low amplitude activity, while the EMG has very low amplitude. This is due to the mobility of the animals during, uh, uh, during sleep. And then um, we observe um, a dominance of theta and gamma activity, which is peculiar of, of wakefulness. From wakefulness, then animals can transition to a first phase of, of sleep, which is, which is defined as non-REM. And here we have a reverse situation here. 
the EG are displaying high amplitude and low frequency, and the EMG are a very low amplitude. This is due to the immobility that is observed during, uh, during sleep itself. But here we have a, a different type of oscillations of the brain. Here we have slow wave activity, which are including slow oscillations, which are oscillations of less than one hertz, and delta waves, which are between 0, 0.5 and 4 hertz. From non-REM, then the animals can transition back to wakefulness, can awaken from non-REM sleep, or sometimes can also transition to a very peculiar phase of sleep, which is defined as REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep. And I'm saying that it's very peculiar because if you compare uh, to wakefulness, you can see that uh, the EEG are almost completely identical, even though the EMG is uh, almost completely flat and this is reflecting a characteristic of REM sleep, which is complete muscle atonia. But here again, we observe a dominance of theta gamma activity similarly to wakefulness. So we can say that at least from a macroscopical perspective, REM and wakefulness are most probably similar. And that this is the reason why REM sleep is also called the paradoxical sleep. So um, REM sleep has been long-lastingly associated with the processing and consolidation of emotional information. This has been shown both in rodent and humans, and it's associated by the fact that uh, activation of uh, uh, REM on neurons in the brainstem are, real, are associated with the theta uh, hippocampal generated activity um, during REM sleep. And this activity is in coherence with regions of the brain that are known to process emotional information. Those are, for example, the basolateral complex of the amygdala and the medial prefrontal cortex. And in literature, we can see that there are multiple regions that are processing emotional information during REM sleep. This has been shown, for example, by uh, Georgi Butsaki a few years ago with uh, Gerardo. They have shown that the uh, putative pyramidal neurons in the basolateral amygdala, which is the core of emotional processing in the brain, those neurons are reactivated during REM sleep. And you can see that their activity is even significantly higher compared to wakefulness. Similarly, in our lab a few years ago, we have found that theta activity generated in the hippocampus during REM sleep is important for the consolidation of emotional related information. When we optogenetically perturb this activity, we found that there was an impairment in the behavioral performances of the animals in the uh, context memory recall test. And more recently, uh, the work of uh, Wen Biogan in New York has found that the dorsal prefrontal cortex is associated with um, uh, uh, restructuring, so uh, reorganization, structural organization of the network upon a, a few conditioning task. And this is strictly linked to the occurrence of REM sleep. In fact, in REM deprived mice, not only they found that there was an impairment in the behavioral performances, but also a loss of this reorganization of the network. And this was not the case when non-REM was disturbed. So there is, um, in summary, a link between the occurrence of REM sleep and the processing of emotional information in several regions, including the prefrontal cortex. Although there is a paradox in, uh, in uh, literature, and this is due to the fact that both in human and animal studies, it has been found that uh, the prefrontal cortex seems to be inhibited or its activity is significantly dampened during, uh, during REM sleep. This is found by uh, a few years ago by Pierre Maquet and colleagues uh, in, in Belgium, where they found that in humans, the uh, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is silent during REM sleep. And this has been confirmed by other clinical studies where they have found that indeed regions in the prefrontal cortex are decreasing significantly their activity during REM sleep compared to, to other states during wakefulness and non-REM, for example. And in animal studies, the work of Pierre Maquet, uh, Pierre Veloupi in Lyon, has found not only that the neurons that are activated during REM sleep are significant, but also that those REM on neurons are not co-localizing with the wake active ones, which is uh, suggesting that uh, even though REM and wake might be similar for, from a microscopical perspective, as I was saying before, it's most probably not the case from a local circuit perspective. And this is exactly the starting point of my, uh, of my postdoc, where I try to understand how um, prefrontal regions perform during REM sleep in mice and how they're able to store emotional information if their activity seems to be uh, silent during REM sleep. So in order to do that, I used uh, two photon calcium imaging uh, in vivo in um, naturally sleeping at fixed mice. Uh, so this technique allows us to record 
a big amount of, uh, of neurons together, so a large population of neurons uh, expressing calcium indicators. So we can record the function of those neurons by capturing their fluorescence uh, during different, so longitudinally during different brain states. So I recorded the same population of neurons in the prefrontal cortex during a non-RAM, during RAM, and during subsequent wakefulness. Um, and I, I first focused on the pyramidal neurons in the superficial layers of the prefrontal cortex because those excitatory neurons, they are uh, the majority in these circuits. They represent 90% of the population of neurons in, the, in, the, uh, in those layers of the prefrontal cortex. So we used uh, the promoter campanase to selectively target those um, pyramidal neurons and we recorded for, firstly the uh, somatic compartments, so the cell bodies of those neurons. And if you look at the, um, the color-coded activity map of those several neurons, you can see that the activity during REM sleep, so here you have a, a REM sleep episode, you can see that their activity by eye is visible that there is a decrease uh, during REM compared to the other states. This is also well visible in the row traces. You can see that the calcium transient are decreasing, so the peaks uh, calcium peaks are decreasing their frequency during REM sleep compared to the other states. And here you have the quantification from uh, uh, several mice. You can see that in all of them, there is a significant decrease during REM sleep compared to wakefulness and non-REM. And in accordance with these findings, we calculated the frequency of all the detected calcium spikes, um, as you can see here in the road traces. And we found that, um, that um, during REM sleep, there is indeed a decreased frequency uh, of these calcium spikes compared to wake and non-REM. Only 18% of all the detected calcium spikes during the imaging sessions occurs during REM sleep. So this suggests that indeed, uh, and, and is confirming what has been previously shown in literature, that the, uh, the neurons, the principal neurons in the uh, prefrontal cortex decreased their activity during REM sleep. But then, then we wonder whether the dendritic compartment of the same neurons was similarly inactivated during REM sleep. So here we used um, a similar technique. We used two photon gas imaging. Uh, we diluted in this case the virus in order to have sparse labeling be able to uh, record uh, isolated portions of dendrites. Um, and we recorded the dendrites of the same, same population of, of neurons expressing the calcium indicator GCAMP. Uh, but in addition, due to the morphology of the dendrites, um, because they are long branches, we decided to split uh, those branches in a small region of interest of one micron in order to have an idea of the propagation of the activity across those branches. Here, for example, you have one single dendrite, which is split in 45 segments. And, and in this way, you can follow uh, how much the, the events are spreading Across the across one single one single dendrite, for example, there are events that are spreading across the entire dendrite. For example, this one, and we define those events as spreading events. While some other they stay very localized. Uh, for example, close to a spine, as seen here, and we define those events as confined events. Well, strikingly, we found that differently from the somatic compartment uh, of the same neurons, the dendrites not only they maintain their activity during REM sleep but their activity is even significantly enhanced. And this is particularly true for the spreading events. And in accordance with these findings, uh, we calculated the average propagation of all the detected events. And we found that in, indeed, the events are propagating more during REM sleep compared to wake and non-REM. So to summarize with this first part, we found that there is indeed that decoupling between the activity of the cell body and the dendrites of the same neurons selectively during REM sleep, where uh, the dendrites, they seem to be uh, subjected to a disinhibition during REM sleep, and in parallel, the cell bodies are most probably subjected to an inhibition. And this is exactly what we tried to, to investigate. We recorded the main inhibitory neurons in the prefrontal cortex and see whether indeed there is an inhibition and disinhibition in parallel during REM sleep. So as you most probably know, there are several types of, of interneurons which are targeting different parts of uh, the principal neurons or even other uh, inhibitory neurons. And we focus on the parvalbum interneurons, which are generally known to target the cell body of, uh, of the principal cells. 
and the VIP and the somatostatin inhibitor in neurons, which are involved in a process of disinhibition of the dendrites. This is because the VIP interneurons are inhibiting this second class, the, uh, the somatostatin, which in turn, they, they provide uh, inhibition at the dendritic level. So we, we use the same approach. We first we started by the palpable interneurons. We used two photon cancer imaging. In this case, we used uh, PV cre mice. So we use a uh, um, um, genetical uh, strategy to target selectively the palpable interneurons and express the calcium indicator in this uh, inhibitory uh, subclass of inhibitory neurons. Here you have an example of parvabu interneurons expressing the calcium indicator, GCAM. And indeed, we found that contrary to the, to the cell body of pyramidal neurons, the parvabu interneurons, they significantly increase their activity during REM sleep. You, you can see that there are, uh, here in all the mice that we recorded, there is an hyperactivation during REM sleep. In this case, 72% uh, of all the uh, recorded parvabu interneurons from several mice is showing its maximal activity during REM sleep. And this suggests that those parvalvo interneurons, which are known to target the cell bodies, might be responsible of the inhibition of the cell body of the pyramidal neurons during REM because they increase their activity and as a consequence, they silence the cell body. So we then use the same strategy to record the other two uh, subpopulation of interneurons in the local circuits. We started by the VIP interneurons and we found that similar to the parvalbum interneurons, the VAP interneurons, again, they increase their activity during REM sleep. Here again, they, they, you can see that they show um, hyperactivation during REM. In this case, more than half of all the detected neurons show its maximal activity during REM. As a consequence, as the VAP interneurons are synapting onto the somatostatin, we recorded the somatostatin and found that on the contrary, the, the somatostatin become almost completely silent during, uh, during REM. So to summarize, um, we found a decoupling of the principal neurons, and this is most probably due to a reorganization of the local inhibitor neurons. So the parvalbo interneurons, they provide inhibition at the cell body, while the VAP interneurons and the somatostatin provide this inhibition because the increased activity of the VAP silence the somatostatin, and as a consequence, the dendrites are disinhibited. They don't have inhibition anymore from the somatostatin. So we then wondered if long range projections from different regions of the brain might be involved in this reorganization, in this excitation inhibition rebalance. And in order to do that, we firstly used uh, a rabies virus uh, targeting approach. Uh, rabies viruses are, are viruses that you inject in a, in a starter cell. So for example, we did it for the PV and the VIP interneurons, and they're able to jump back one synapse and they're they um, expressing fluorescence in the, uh, in the uh, actually, uh, compartments, presynaptic compartments that, that are projecting to the starting cell. So in this case, this is a strategy that allows to, um, to uh, target the, uh, the presynaptic compartments projecting to uh, the cells of interest. And although we, uh, we injected the, the rabies virus in the VAP, uh, we couldn't find any uh, region that is clearly projecting monosynaptically to the VAP, but we found that there are several regions that are projecting monosynaptically to the parvalbum interneurons. Um, those are, uh, for example, the central medial thalamus, the retrosplenial cortex, and the somatosensory barrier cortex. So here you have an example, you can see that we injected in the uh, parvalbumin uh, in neurons uh, the rabies virus. You can see that uh, uh, those are expressing the starter virus. And then those viruses, they jump back and you can see um, actually the regions that project to the parvalbumin neurons. So in this case, we focus on the central medial thalamus because we know that this region is regulating sleep and also because it's the region that is most densely projecting to the uh, to the parvalbum interneurons. We also used a second uh, strategy. We use electrophysiology to confirm that the central medial thalamus is monosynaptically contacting the parvalbum interneurons in the prefrontal cortex. So in this case, we express uh, channel rhodopsin is an excitatory opsin that is uh, light sensitive. Um, and we stimulated those axons from the central medial thalamus and we recorded the activity of the parvalbum interneurons. Well, uh, one millisecond stimulation of those axons from the thalamus was sufficient to induce 
an excitatory response in the parvalbumin interneurons with a latency of three milliseconds from the stimulation, which correspond uh, roughly to a monosynaptic contact. So we use two different strategies to confirm that there is indeed a monosynaptic connection between the projections from the thalamus and the parvalbum interneurons, the prefrontal cortex. So then we moved back to in vivo recording. So we used uh, the same strategy that I showed at the beginning of the, of the talk. Uh, so we used two photon calcium imaging, but in this case, we expressed the calcium indicator in the central middle thalamus, uh, and we recorded the projections, um, and so the axons from those neurons in the prefrontal cortex. Here you have an example of those axons expressing the calcium indicator, which are mainly um, in the superficial, very superficial layers of the prefrontal cortex here. For example, you have a blood vessel, very superficial, and this is the su surface of the brain. You can see that there are several uh, axons from the central medial thalamus. So we recorded those axons during uh, uh, sleep, particularly with an interest during REM sleep. And we found that indeed, selectively during the REM sleep, those axons, they increase significantly their activity similarly to the parvalbum interneurons. Here you can see again that uh, those axons, they are very active during REM sleep. In this case, even 77% of all the detected axons is showing its maximal activity during REM sleep. But this is still not proving that those axons are responsible of the increased activity of the parvalbum neurons and consequently the silencing of the cell bodies of the pyramidal cells. In order to prove that, we did in this case dual color to photon calcium imaging, where we simultaneously recorded the pyramidal cell bodies, uh, so the cell bodies of the principal cells in the uh, prefrontal cortex, and the parvalbumin interneurons express in this case a red switch calcium indicator R camp. So pyramidal cell bodies express the calcium indicator G camp, and the parvalbumin interneurons express the uh, red switch calcium indicator R camp. So we were able to record with dual colors uh, both populations. But in addition, what we did is that we use optogenetics, so this um, inhibitory opsin, to uh, selectively inhibit um, the projections from the central medial thalamus during REM sleep. So when those axons have shown to be increasing their activity. Um, so switch R, which is a very peculiar opsin, is a B-stable opsin that is activated by blue light um, and is inhibiting um, the cells that are expressing this opsin until uh, we shine red light. So between blue and red light, we inhibited the uh, central medial thalamus and we did that selectively during REM sleep. Well, inhibition of those axons from the thalamus during REM sleep was sufficient to reactivate the cell bodies of pyramidal neurons to a level that was similar to wavefulness, while in parallel, the parvabo interneurons decreased significantly their activity, again, to a level that was uh, similar to wavefulness. So we restore, restore um, sort of wake-like activity only by silencing the projections from the thalamus. And this is proving that the central middle thalamus, those projections are uh, responsible in mediating the activity of the parvalbum in interneurons and consequently the silencing of the cell body of pyramidal neurons. And then we used a similar approach to causally prove that uh, um, in parallel, the VIP interneurons are responsible of the increased activity on the contrary of the dendrites. Um, so in this case, the uh, inhibitory opsins, which are, was expressed in the VIP interneurons, and we recorded in parallel the activity of the dendrites in this case. Again, we silenced the VIP interneurons selectively during the REM sleep by activating with blue light, inhibiting with red light. And this again was sufficient to significantly decrease the activity of the dendrites, uh, both the confined events and the spreading events. So um, as a summary, we found that during REM sleep, uh, there is a decoupling between the activity of the cell body and the dendrites of the same neurons. The uh, cell body is inhibited because the projection of the central medial thalamus drive the increased activity of the parvalbum interneurons, and in turn, they silence the cell body. In parallel, the VIP interneurons, they increase their activity, they silence the somatostatin, and these disinhibit the dendrites. There is a decoupling because there is a reorganization of local, uh, in, or local um, inhibitory neurons selectively during REM sleep. 
But then we wonder the, about the function of this mechanism. So now we have a mechanism. We want to know whether this mechanism is involved in uh, uh, consolidating and processing emotional information, for example, during REM sleep. And in order to do that, mice were subjected to a uh, fear conditioning task. Uh, fear conditioning is a very simple uh, task. It's a Pavlovian conditioning, where during the acquisition phase, uh, mice are subjected to the presentation of two auditory cues of different uh, frequency that are called the CS minus and CS plus. So CS is for conditioned stimulus. Uh, the CS plus is uh, positively paired to an aversing event, so a food shock uh, on the pose of the animals. And this association makes that uh, the animals learn that this auditory cue is predictive of a danger. So the day after, when we retest them, uh, even the only presentation of the sounds uh, generates a fearful response in the animals, which is in general in the mice uh, freezing, so in mobility. Um, in parallel, the CS minus, which is not paired to the food shock, is a, is a control cue, uh, is not paired to the food shock, and the animal learns that this cue is not uh, encoding for danger, so it's encoding for, for safety, because is uh, uh, after this sound there is uh, there is no uh, there is no food shock, so the animal learns that uh, one cue is predicting for safety and one one cue is predicting for danger. And the animal, you can test this memory by by uh, by uh, calculating the time the animal uh, stayed immobile, so it froze uh, during the presentation of the sound. But what did we did in addition was that between the conditioning, so the learning phase. And the day after the recall, um, during during the sleep phase, so during the, what we define the uh, consolidation window of this memory, selectively during REM sleep for four hours, we uh, perturb this decoupling uh, that we that we uh, defined before. So, or by inhibiting the VIP interneurons uh, optogenetically. So, in other words, if we block the VIP interneurons, we block the disinhibition of the dendrites. Or in a second group of animals we block the parvalbum interneurons during REM sleep. So in this case, inhibiting the parvalbum interneurons provides a reactivation of the cell bodies of the pyramidal neurons. In, in both cases, we, we played with this decoupling and we perturb the decoupling or at the dendritic level of, or at the somatic level. Well, this was sufficient to provide two opposite behavioral outcomes. Uh, when we block the VIP interneurons, uh, the day after the animals, they completely generalized. We're not able to distinguish between the CS minus and the CS plus. In green, you have the uh, the controlled mice. You can see that the controlled mice, they they can discriminate between the two auditory cues. They they almost don't freeze in response to the CS minus, a safe cue, but they freeze uh, very, uh, very, they display very high fearful response to the CS plus, the dangerous cues. And you can see that when we block the VIP interneurons, they, they freeze to everything. It's like they, they didn't uh, consolidate the discriminative memory. But on the contrary, when we block the parvabum interneurons, um, those animals, they discriminated even better. So they, their ability to discriminate between the CS minus and the CS plus is even enhanced compared to the controls. So you can see that the dis discrimination score is very poor when, when we block the VIP interneurons during REM sleep and is even significantly enhanced when we block the uh, parvabu interneurons during, uh, during REM. So two opposite uh, behavioral outcomes only by uh, or deactivating the dendrites or reactivating the cell body. And finally, we also shown that uh, this, um, this mechanism is relying upon uh, local synaptic, synaptic plasticity. So uh, here what we did was that the same animals that underwent uh, fear conditioning task, the brain were then sliced and we record uh, ex vivo uh, patch clamp recordings. In particular, we calculated the unpanning duration, which is uh, an electrophysiological measure, uh, clear measure for synaptic plasticity. And we found that indeed, when we block the VIP interneurons, no plasticity occurred. Uh, you can see that the, the level of unpanning duration is similar to naive mice, so mice that didn't, didn't undergo the fear conditioning task, while, while it is enhanced when blocking the parvalbu interneurons. So there is a, a, a very tight link between synaptic plasticity in the prefrontal cortex and the behavioral output, means that 
when we block the VIP interneurons, so in other words, we block the dendrites, um, no plasticity occurred. And as a consequence, the mice didn't consolidate the discriminative information and they were not able to discriminate between the CS minus and the CS plus. On the contrary, when we block the parvalgo interneurons, so in other words, we reactivated the cell bodies, um, there is hyper um, increased synaptic plasticity and this result in uh, over consolidation of the discriminative information. And I'm, I'm saying over consolidation because the day after, uh, when we retested this uh, a subgroup of these mice uh, with a second task, um, a behavioral task where uh, the animal has to learn that now the CS plus, which was a danger before, is not predictive of a danger anymore, it's called, uh, it's called fear extinction. The animal learns progressively that the CS plus is not a danger anymore. This is only made by uh, represented several times, uh, in this case, 24 times the CS plus uh, without the presentation of the food shock. So the animal learns to progressively decrease, as you can see here in the control, the fearful response to the CS plus. Well, we found that blocking the parvalgo interneurons uh, provide inability of those animals to, uh, to extinguish the task. It means that a complete somatodendritic decoupling with the inhibition of the cell body and the disinhibition of the dendrites is necessary to optimize uh, future behavioral responses to emotional stressors. And if we, uh, we block, we, we perturb this decoupling, this results in a sort of uh, post-traumatic stress disorder behavior where, where the animals are not able to extinguish a fearful response. So uh, to summarize, um, uh, as a conclusion, we found that selectively during REM sleep, there is a decoupling in the prefrontal circuits where the cell body of pyramidal neurons is inhibited and the dendrites, they disinhibit, they're disinhibited. This, and this is due to a reorganization of the local interneurons, also regulated by long range projections from the thalamus. The activity of the dendrites is necessary to store emotional information during REM sleep. If we block this dendritic activity, the animals are not able to, to store this information. But it's also important to uh, silence the cell body of the, of the, pyramidal, uh, of the pyramidal neurons. And this provides a cortex disconnection. So the dendrites, they, they um, consolidate emotional information, but the, the output of the cell is silent and this avoid interfering, for example, with downstream targets during sleep. Uh, this might be also a mechanism of, of dreams that's why uh, during dreams we have uh, local local activity that is uh, reprogrammed because you have to imagine REM sleep as a sort of um, uh, isolated cortical unit uh, because the cell body, so the output of the cells is blocked. Uh, it's also, it can also be seen as a mechanism of uh, synaptic downscaling and upscaling, which occurs in different compartments of the same neurons during REM sleep. And also a mechanism of, of energy conservation because during REM sleep, um, the dendrites, they, they do their job, they, they store the information, but the cell body is maintained inhibited, this save energy at the somatic level. Um, so there are still several open questions and there are future directions. Um, for example, we still don't know what is driving the activity of the VIP interneurons. Uh, we, we suspect that neuron modulation, particularly, particularly cholinergic inputs from the basal forebrain, which are very, known to be very active during REM sleep, are playing a role in, uh, um, um, in driving the activity of the VIP interneurons uh, during REM sleep. Uh, this is also uh, suggested by literature. It's, it's shown that VIP interneurons express receptors, cholinergic receptors. We still don't know also what is driving the activity of the dendrites because the VIP act as a, as a disinhibition substrate for disinhibition of the dendrites. But these dendrites, they, they have to receive emotional information from some, somewhere. So um, in my future directions, I will target uh, the amygdala because this is the core of emotional processing. And uh, I would like to see whether the amygdala is indeed transferring emotional information during REM sleep to, to the prefrontal cortex. Um, and also, we still don't know whether this mechanism of, of somatodendritic decoupling is specific of the prefrontal cortex, or this is something that exists also in other cortical regions, or why not also in other subcortical regions. 
And with that, I'm, I'm concluding. Um, just would like to thank the people who work on this uh, on this study, uh, as well as my mentor, uh, Professor Damantidis, uh, our collaborators from Italy, and I thank you for your attention. Um, all right, thank you very much for this very interesting talk. Um, so now we open the floor for questions from the audience. Um, and in the meantime, I would like to say, um, as a computational neuroscientist, this is uh, very compelling evidence for me that we really need to go beyond point neurons and actually model the dendrites as well. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, thank you for that. It's uh, it's really nice. Um, okay, so do we have any questions from the audience or from the hosts? Um if not, maybe in the meantime, um, I can ask uh, one question. Yeah. Um, so um, you talked about uh, PTSD in this case, um, but also um, another disorder where uh, patients suffer from impaired emotional memory, and they also have an altered EI balance in the prefrontal cortex, and they also have reduced uh, REM sleep is schizophrenia. So I wanted to ask if you think uh, the, this dysfunction of the somatodendritic coupling is, is something that could explain uh, could explain this. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, we're completely convinced that there is a, a tight link, bidirectional link between uh, uh, psychiatric disorders and, and sleep itself, particularly uh, REM sleep. And indeed, there are several psychiatric disorders where uh, um, there is a, a bidirectional uh, impairment of... of uh, um, actually uh, REM sleep, um, so sleep, sleep impairments, for example, uh, REM fragmentation of decreased quality of sleep in general. Also, uh, as, you, as you said, in schizophrenia, but also other type of psychiatric disorder and depression. And um, so we, we hypothesize that this uh, uh, somatodendritic coupling might be a target for, uh, for future therapeutic strategies for uh, several type of, uh, of, of uh, psychiatric disorders. Okay. Um, thank you. And also, uh, because you now mentioned uh, therapeutic targets. So, of course, in, in mice, it's easy. We can use optogenetics and then turn uh, the circuits on and off. Um, but what would be um, potential therapeutic um, appl like applications in, in humans? So are there any pharmacological interventions or stimulation or something like that? Yeah, so, um, yeah, of course, these, uh, uh, all these neurons uh, that we are targeting, so the circuits that we, that we identified have uh, neurons with different markers. So we can, we can think, for example, to uh, restore this decoupling by, by acting on a specific population of, uh, for example, we did it optogenetically in mice by, um, by focusing on the VAP, uh, VAP interneurons or Parvalbo interneurons, but uh, those those neurons can be targeted by pharmacologically, also with uh, with uh, molecular market, uh, uh, yeah, molecular mo molecular strategies in uh, in the human brain, for example. I see. Um, yeah, that's that's really cool. Um, okay, if there are no more questions, then this. Um, I, I would assume no. Then um, I would like to thank you again for, for taking part in our conference today. Um, and also thank again, uh, Professor Adamant Adamantidis for, um, um, yeah, for presenting you here. Um, and yeah, then um, I will keep yeah. the uh, Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for the invitation.